Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll probably get this kicked off around 3.33. Let some people get signed into WebEx here, and uh, we'll get started here shortly. Thank you. Hey, Matt, are you ready? Ready to go. Perfect. All right, thank you everyone for joining us here this afternoon. We're excited to have you. Um, I'm gonna kick this straight off to Matt Scarchilli from Sandler Training. We're doing part two of the Sandler Series Sales Training, but don't worry if you missed part one, you will still find a lot of value in part two here. Um, this is supposed to be an interactive and informative session. So if you do have any questions for Matt, please send them in, send them in the chat right away and I will address them and communicate them to Matt. If you're willing to turn on your audio or your video and audio, and you're comfortable doing that, we can promote you to the video option and you can ask him directly. Like I mentioned, this is supposed to be an informative, interactive session. This is not a panel event. Um, so any questions you have, um, whether they're on topic or a little bit off tech topic in the sales process, in the sales world, Matt is the expert. Send them in the chat and I will address them um, after the, um, session we'll have a, uh, a survey for feedback sent to you via email we'd appreciate if you could fill that out as we are all adjusting to 2020 we're all adjusting to the virtual setting so we'd love to have your um, feedback um, to and continue improving um, these webinars so nonetheless Matt the floor is yours thank you again for doing this and um, let's have some fun all right Sam thanks for the intro I appreciate it so uh, I find kind of funny so um, last name is pronounced Scarkelli and 
nobody can say the damn name, let alone spell it. So if you look at my email address on there, it's matt.scar. I figured nobody can spell my last name. Nobody can say my last name. So I might as well put it as something that people can remember. So take the name and, and email address down if you want to connect after the event. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. If we, if I don't get to anything in the chat box, you know, if it gets super busy, um, I will commit to answering any questions that anybody has. Just have to give me a shout and let me know. So, Sam, thank you for the opportunity. Bob, uh, thank you for the opportunity and Ignite you and Nice Tech. Uh, love being here. I love doing these things, uh, and I'm looking forward to the next uh, 55 minutes or so. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Matt Scar Kelly. Um, and uh, I own Sandler Training here in Albany, and I have for the last four plus years. Uh, prior to owning Sandler Training, I was actually a client of Sandler's. So uh, I went through the entire process first. Uh, we had a good successful exit out of my last business and allowed me to continue my professional career here at Sandler. So for those of you who don't know Sandler, Sandler's an international company. We specialize in three types of training, what we're known mostly for is sales training. We also conduct management training and customer service training. And I also do a fair uh, amount of consulting on the sales side as well. Um, typically, when I work with companies who they are facing one of a few issues, either they're frustrated that there's not enough leads at the top of the sales funnel, or they're angry that the sales cycles take two or three times longer than they should, or they just get downright upset that they get in great conversations with people and then those people disappear. So. If any of those issues are happen to you, uh, maybe we should have a, a conversation. And again, the information is, is up. I do want to offer everybody some free content. So on the website is my um, my company website, winningprocess.sandler.com. If you put a backslash sell after that, you'll get access to all types of Sandler free content, including worksheets, um, uh, podcasts. Um, video casts, all types of different things. So feel free to help yourself. Uh, we also put out a, a monthly newsletter. If you'd like a newsletter, just send me a, a quick email. Sam hit it on the head, interactive session, folks. So I'll ask, I'll be asking questions. Put your answers in the chat box. As Sam said, if you, if you feel comfortable being on video, just step up. So let's get it going. First question for you guys. What does it mean to qualify a prospect? Now, I'll give you guys some time to type because I know it takes a long time to type that out. If anybody wants to be on video, just raise your hand, Sam will facilitate that. But what does it mean to qualify a prospect? It's a big question. Right? So, um, different, and I'm going to talk while you're writing. Hopefully, you're typing. Um, if not, you're going to hurt my feelings, and I'm a pretty sensitive guy. So, I'd really like your, your input and, and uh, participation here. What's it mean to qualify a prospect? So I'm going to refer back to last week's session and remind people that we could sell more in less time if we have a process in place. And part of that process is understanding what a qualified prospect is and what a, what a non-qualified prospect is. Now I have a couple answers in the chat here. All right, ready, go. Um, Gregor, I believe he was with us last week. Gregor, uh, um, welcome his, back. His answer was to determine if they could actually make a purchase. Good. Okay. I like that. And audience, don't be shy. You can type it in the chat on the right side panel of the WebEx um, portal. Uh, as Matt is asking you questions. The idea is that you guys responded into it in the chat or obviously in video if you're comfortable doing so. Um, so as Matt's having the conversations throughout today, don't be shy. There's no wrong answers. We're all here to learn and, and Matt will address them accordingly and with his expertise. So. And don't worry, I'll bug you until you type something in there too. So that's the kind Thanks. of guy I am. We have another answer. All right. Um, from Carl. Qualify to identify if there's an initial reason to pursue the sales process, size, budget, decision maker, et cetera, are important initial keys. Awesome. Uh, Carl, sounds like you, uh, you have a very good process in place there. So assuming that there weren't any other answers or people aren't still typing, um, I really, I'm going to, I'm going to, 
just jump right on to what Carl's answer was, because in my world, a prospect isn't qualified until they have a, we can prove that they have a pain that we can solve. We can prove that they have a budget that we can work under. And we can understand the entire decision making process and we accept the rules by which they're making those decisions. This in the Sandler world is qualification until you can answer all three of those questions thoroughly. The prospect isn't qualified. Now, will all prospects buy if they're thoroughly qualified? No, I'm not saying that they will be, but I can tell you that you'll waste less time. If you disqualify folks earlier in the process and not string them along. So again, we're talking about process here. We're talking about qualifying. And today we're gonna to focus specifically on bullet number one. We're gonna focus on figuring out what the pain is. And in Sandler terms, pain is a reason to do business. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about what their pain is next week when we reconvene we're going to talk about uncovering their budget and that doesn't just mean money that means their resources and time as well you know things that they have to be willing and able to invest we're also going to talk next week about their decision making process and um it's not just the who right so decision is make is understanding who's making the decision who what when where how and why Ran out of fingers. Who, what, when, where, how, and why? And so we'll talk about that next week. So let's talk about what today is going to look like for us. We know a how to qualify a prospect. You know they have to have these three things in place, and b that we're going to focus on pain. So today we're going to talk about buying emotions. Talk about the elements of pain. We're going to talk about the pain funnel questions. And if anybody has been introduced to Sandler before, you know there's about 7,004,332.1 rules in Sandler. So we'll talk about a couple of those today as well. And actually, to get us kicked off, why don't we start with those rules? Prospects buy for their reasons, not the salesperson's reasons. So, you know this is interactive, right? You know I'm going to be asking you questions. You know I want you to participate. So what do you think that means? Prospects buy for their reasons, not the salesperson's reasons. And you can, those of you who participated last week, think back to some of the things we talked about last week as well. So Sam, what do we have for answers in there? What do we think this rule means? Still waiting on some responses. Oh, come on, guys. You can't leave me hanging here. That means they're writing a really in-depth response. So maybe it's oh, taking yeah, that right. Time, right? So Sam's much smarter than I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not that, I'm not that bright. Uh, from Sarah, I think she was with us last week. Most prospects don't really care what the inputs are from the salesperson, but rather are working on their own timeline. All right, Sarah. Well said. Sarah hit the nail on the head there, right? So. What I hear a lot of times when people are selling is their feature benefit selling. So they're not caring what the prospect wants or needs. They're, all they care about is telling someone all the good things about their, their product or their service. This is all the things that we do and this is how it'll benefit you and we can do this and we can do that. How many times have you heard that in a sales pitch? We can do this and we can do that and we solve this and we solve, who cares, right? They have their own reasons for buying. It's our job as salespeople to figure that out, not tell them why they should buy, but rather to tailor our proposal to what they need. So thank you, Sarah. The chat is on fire right now, Matt. We got a few responses, so Woo! let's go through them. Love it. Um, Peace would, people buy stuff to meet their needs or perceived needs. That's right. Well said. What's the next one? It's always about the prospect, never you from Janine. So those last two are really good. At the end of the day, 
if we're going to separate ourselves out as salespeople from every other salesperson out there, we want to do what all three of those comments said. We, we want to make sure that our sales process involves the prospect. It doesn't talk at the prospect. It talks with the prospect. So that's, a, that's three good interpretations of that rule. How about the next one? Not every prospect is qualified to become a customer. Well, why not? Right. Why not? I have a couple of responses. I don't know if they're applicable to bullet point two here, Matt, but okay. Carl responding to the initial bullet point. This is more about the nuances of the prospect's pain and needs. The salesperson knows the general market need only. That's right. So Carl's got that right. It, otherwise, they probably wouldn't even be a prospect, right? So as a, as a salesperson, we have to know our market but we don't know what the specific need is of the person that we're talking to. Well said. And Christy, I think she was with us last week, if I remember her name. Um, problem they are trying to solve. So the problem they're trying to solve. That's right. And maybe there isn't a problem. And if there isn't a problem, that probably goes to bullet number two, right? Yeah. And uh, Janine, I think, has a response for bullet point number two. You sometimes have to say no to certain prospects if they aren't the right fit. It saves you time and money in the long term. Oh, gosh, yes. Who here has gotten a client that they've worked so hard to get and they were, they were just a pain in the butt along the way, right? So the whole sales process, they were kind of a pain to you, but you, you had this thing, like, I got to get them, I got to get them. Then you get them and they're your nightmare for the next two years. You know, they're the ones calling you every 30 minutes. Hey, Matt, I got a problem. Hey, Matt, how about this? Hey, Matt, how about that? Hey, what about this billing problem? What? Oh, my gosh. Yes, not every prospect is qualified to become a customer. And there are numerous reasons why we could disqualify someone, not just because they're a pain in the butt. Could be that they don't have a pain that we can solve. Could be that they don't have any money to spend. Could be that they don't have any time to implement the services that we have. Or it could be that they have a decision-making process that we don't understand or we're not going to play by those rules. So not every prospect is qualified to become a customer. I'll go back to last week. Let's not mix up interest and qualification, folks, to very different things. All right, last one, then we'll move on. People buy emotionally. They make their decisions intellectually. Ooh, what do we think about that? People buy emotionally. First of all, do you buy into that concept? Do people buy emotionally? Or do they buy intellectually? I'm, I'm assuming we have hot fingers out there typing away. Well, we'll hurt that nobody's come on camera with me, though. Just kidding. A little bit. All right, we got some responses. If anyone wants to jump in via video or at least audio, just in parentheses, put video and audio or audio, and I'll promote you right up. Oh, we got a few responses here. Let's see, trying to go where I left off as the chat is really on fire right now, which is great. Uh, they need to feel something from Gregor. Yeah, there's gotta be something inside, right? Some emotion that drives them to do, to make a purchase. Thanks, Gregor. And we have from Kelly. Yes, they do. Middle-aged men don't need a sports car, but they are emotional. <laughs> they are emotional, and they want one. Uh, Kelly, I'm gonna tell you what kind of car I drive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sarah, there's an emotional component. It may be an intellectual decision, but the impetus to buy is always is nearly always emotional. You're Kelly, 100% right. The impetus to buy is uh, not nearly almost or not almost nearly emotional whatever those words the combination of words are they are always emotional when you boil it down people buy emotionally and it sounds like we're all bought into that concept so i'm not going to waste any time on that but that, that's a really important concept though so do i have someone out there and if not that that's perfectly fine that made a purchase recently, you know, a decent sized purchase, you know, it doesn't have to be a new house or car or anything, but maybe a, a cell phone or a hot water heater for their house or a new lawn mower or whatever it is that would like to play along. And if not, that that's fine. I don't get anybody to raise their hand in the next 10 seconds. I'll just go, go forward. 
Are you looking for a volunteer to yeah, come on I'm video? For a volunteer. Uh, Gregor says he'll play. So, All Gregor, right. if you're comfortable, I'm going to promote you to video and audio. If you just give me a second here, that's going to take just two seconds. Bear with me. Here we go. It was Gregor, I believe. And we're going to. I think you have to accept it, Gregor. I tried to make you a panelist. All right, you are a panelist now. Perfect. Hey, Gregor. Nice to see you again. Hey, Matt. Hey, Sam. How you doing, Gregor? Thanks for joining hey, us. Good to see you guys. Thanks for including me. No problem. Happy to thanks do for, so. Thanks for putting your hand up and, and being a little vulnerable. So, Greg, what was the Gregor? What was the last um, uh, decent sized purchase you made? Well, the purchase that came to mind is um, I bought a new sofa slash uh, chase thing for me to sit and uh, do some work on when I'm in the living room and I don't feel like being in the office. So uh, it's probably like two grand. That sounds comfy. <laughs> I want one now. So tell me a little bit about why you purchased it, Gregor. Um, the experience I had, I I have I do some kind of digital nomad work. Mm -hmm. So I travel, I used to travel, uh, get yeah. projects, and then, you know, I was in Argentina for two months, I was in Europe, so, and I had stayed in an Airbnb that had a really, really sweet sofa, and I was right. able to wheel their big television set in front of me and just camp out. And I was just like perfectly comfortable for, you know, for hours, just sitting in a way, had my laptop plugged in and, and you know, it was in a nice climate, beautiful place. So uh, I just had this experience where I was like, okay, I got to replicate that. Ah, all right. So you got back home and um, how long ago was that experience, Gregor? Uh, a year and a half. A year and a half ago. All right, so in the year and a half between the time you had the experience and the time you made the purchase, was there anything you did to try to replicate that um, before you actually bought the piece of furniture? Um, did you move your TV around, maybe put some pillows on the couch, anything like that? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I basically tried to improvise. I used a kind of footstool or ottoman in front of a chair I had. Like I was, yeah, I was trying to rig up some different options uh, at home. So clearly that didn't work for you, right? So, cause you, you ended up buying the, buying the piece. Um, did you need the piece? No. No, it's <laughs> flat out. It's like, no, not at all. So, so why did you buy it? Uh, I'm an optimizer. So like I knew, I knew the things that I were, was doing you know, with the ottoman, I had it set up. I was like, that worked, but like, I know I can take this to the next level if I get like this really nice setup. Very good. So at the end of the day, you ended up making a purchase um, out of an emotional desire for this to replicate the experience that you had a year and a half ago when you were traveling. Yeah. Is that right? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So. At the end of the day, Gregor may have wanted this piece of furniture, um, but it was the emotion that drove him to make the purchase. So that, that's good. Thank you, Gregor. I appreciate you playing along. Uh, I may call you back, but I think we're good for now. Right. Um, and that was that exercise was simply to make us understand that regardless of why someone. So when Gregor made the, the decision to purchase, it was very emotional. He wanted to replicate this process. Now, I'm sure there was an intellectual piece that kicked in, right? So he probably didn't want to spend $20,000 on, on the piece of furniture. He probably didn't want to spend $5,000 on the piece of furniture. So he had to work through that intellectual piece as well. But the decision to purchase was emotional. Now, clearly that was an easy emotional thing to, to tease out of someone, but regardless of what it is that you purchased. So a friend of mine had a leak in his uh, water tank you had to buy a water tank, right? So that's that's what he had to do. But the real reason why he had to purchase the, the, the water tank ended up being emotional because he needed to make sure that he was comfortable taking a shower or and <laughs> that his significant other didn't get angry at him. So it always boils back to emotion. 
Before I flip this, this slide, can I ask anybody to guess what are the buying emotions? I know this, if, if, you haven't, if you've been through Sandler before, you've probably heard this. If you haven't, it might be a bit of a stretch of an ask, but I wanna try to get your heads wheeling in the right place. What are the buying emotions that, that you want to, to, to tap into? Or I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. What are the buying emotions that cause people to purchase? I'm gonna give you just 20 seconds to put a couple things in the chat, and then we're gonna to go to the next slide. And Sam, if there's anything in there, you gotta give me a, a hand. No, of course. Um, we have fear. Ah, good. Really That's good. Who said one. that? Who uh, said Greg, that? Scott and Gregor. And Scott also mentioned excitement. Awesome. Um, comfort and trust from Christy. Yeah. Let's see what else we have in here. They're coming in. People are thinking. Every, every one of you are right. But to boil it down to the easiest way for us to think about it, here are your four buying emotions. People buy for present pain. People buy for present pleasure. People buy because they want to avoid future pain or they buy because they want to have future pleasure. Those are your four buying emotions. And I'll ask you, do you are you aware of which buying emotion you're tapping into with your prospect? Now, before I get into your company specifically, can anybody put in a, an example real quick in the chat? An example of buying for pain in the present. Why would I buy for pain in the present? I gave you an example, hint, hint, about 20 seconds ago. Water heater from Gregor. <laughs> he's doing a lot of home. He's doing a lot of home remodeling. And Someone the listens to me. Yes. So uh, immediate pain or pain in the present it would be a hot water heater broke. Now, uh, Chris, getting... I'm sorry, Matt. I'm just gonna say, Christy, on the same page, something broke down. Very good. Okay. So give me an example of pain in the future. Trying to because you're, you're purchasing because you want to prevent pain in the future. Insurance from Gregor. Bingo. Computer is getting older and slower from Carl. Perfect, Carl. Right, so you Off, guys get the offsetting idea. Offsetting poor health. Offsetting poor health from Janine. Very good. How about pleasure in the present? It's an example of buying something. <laughs> uh, we got some good ones in here. Uh, right. We got chocolate from Gregor. Yes. Uh, a personal favorite of mine. Carl mentioned beer. And <laughs> Janine mentioned clothes. <laughs> That's right. My, my favorite example of that is standing in line at Price Chopper, right? They put the damn payday candy bars right in my way. So that's an, that's an impulse, you know, immediate pleasure. How about future pleasure? I'm just waiting for Kelly to say the sports car again. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's future pleasure, actually, right? So that could be the future pleasure one. Uh, 401k from Gregor. Yep. Carl, he's trying to find his beach with his beer post-COVID vacation. Ah, there you go. Perfect example. We all, we all need that, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Good stuff. So now that we kind of have this idea of where our buying emotions are, we've got examples of them. I'm going to ask, and if somebody wants to raise their hand and, you know, you don't even have to come on the video, you can just do the audio portion. You can put it in the chat too. Tell me about your business. What buying emotion do you think you're tapping into when you are selling your product or service? And I'll give you, there will be people out there that says, well, it depends. And you're right. So I'll give you a second to type that in. What buying emotion are you tapping into selling your product or service? Uh, Gregor mentioned pain in the present. Okay. And what's your, uh, we're gonna need some context for everybody who doesn't know Gregor. So tell us what your business is in a, in a three words or five words. Uh, Gregor, um, you should have capabilities on audio yourself if you wanted to. That's not no big deal. 
Oh, uh, so uh, can you hear me? I just unmuted. Yes. But, yeah, so I put organizational training into the chat. Um, I do training programs with companies and they usually bring me in when some, you know, they, they've got an issue. They've got somebody who, you know, people saying things they shouldn't say um, or, you know, some any other of a host of kind of, I would I would call HR issues. Right. And so that could be could be a number of different things, right? Depending on who the person is sitting in the seat. So it could be the, the person who's thinking, oh, my gosh, we can't have this happen again in the future. So the buying emotion could be avoiding future pain. Or it could be someone sitting in the seat that you're selling to, Gregor, that is like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this happened. We have to have training right now so this person learns from it. Right. So that's the, the present pain. So there, we have a. Go ahead. Sorry, Matt. No, I was going to say we have another volunteer to go on audio whenever Good. you're ready. I'm ready to go. Uh, Gregor, if you wouldn't mind unmuting, or Gregor, if you wouldn't mind muting yourself, I'm going to unmute Carl. Carl, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How about you guys? Hey, doing Carl. Good. Carl in the chat mentioned mostly present pain. If you want to elaborate on that, Carl. Sure. So I sell to trucking companies, primarily focusing on the uh, safety and compliance uh, at, you know, managers and their, their pain is usually immediate. They've, uh, or it's, it's, uh, recent past where, uh, they have some compliance issue and it's, it's cost all, all kinds of problems for them. And, uh, you know, it could be fines. It could be, uh, a DOT audit. It, it or it could be something a little less than that. And just, uh, the annoyance of having to manage and track you know, truck drivers and all their vehicles on, on such a regular basis. It can be a real difficult so, task and, and it's menial, so it's not fun. Carl, um, do you think it could be a, a, a pleasure in the future sell? Is that possible? Oh, oh, abs well, absolutely. So the, the interesting thing in a way is that, you know, I, I sell based on the present pain, but my current customers get back to me and they're telling me about what a pleasure it is to not have to actually do that stuff anymore. What a what an awesome learning experience there, right? So to have your clients tell you where their where their pain lands and uh, they're telling you that it's it's yes, it's important that I have take care of the issue now, but it's just important for me to be able to sit on my newly bought couch that Gregor has and kick my feet up and not have to worry about it. So, that's an awesome learn. Thank you for sharing, Carl. Sure. Thanks, Carl. So um, um, Janine in the in the chat mentioned pain and present and pleasure in the future. I'm not sure if Janine wants to step up, but um, just another example there, Matt. Okay. If Janine didn't raise her hand, I'll ask everybody to put in the chat. What do you think the strongest buying emotion is? I think that strongest one is. Carl mentioned present pain. Scott mentioned present pain is the strongest pain in the present from Janine. Yeah, hundred percent. I got some winners on the phone today. I knew that from last week, though. So yes, hundred percent pain in the present. So if you're in a if you're in a selling situation, and you're tapping into a couple of different buying emotions, and you get a hint that one of those buying emotions is present pain. That's the one you want to latch on to to help close that sale faster, because that is the most powerful buying emotion. You know, if I if I walk in and I got a cut on my finger and I need a band aid, that's present pain. I need to take care of it. So well done. Thank you everybody for playing along there. Okay, so we know that people buy emotionally. Now we know what those buying emotions are. Now let's talk about the fact that you're prospect probably doesn't know what their buying emotion is. Your prospect is going to come to you with a surface level pain. They're going to come to you with what we refer to in Sandler as a pain indicator. Okay, they're not going to say, hey, I need to buy this because this is how it's going to affect me in two months. They're going to come to you and just say, hey, I need this because. And when they say they're because, that's their surface level pain. I need this thing. So, for example, in my world, a surface level pain would be something like people don't have enough leads at the top of the sales funnel. 
right? So I talk to business owners all the time. So I, I ask them, so what's bothering you? Geez, I got a great sales team. You know, once they get the once they get a prospect in their in their grips and they have a good conversation, they close the deal. Probably a son of a gun. There's just not enough leads at the top of the funnel to feed them. So that's a surface level pain. Now, is that his real pain or her real pain? No, it's not. And we'll work through that. So the three levels of pain are surface pain. There's a, a middle pain. There's the reasons why the surface level pain happens. And then what we want to get down to is that personal impact. So there's three levels of pain here. The surface level pain is the what, what's going on? What's the problem that they have? The reasons for the problem, that's the why. These are business causes of pain. What, are, what how is it affecting the business, right? So these are very intellectual pieces. So the top part is, you know, just think of it as a funnel, right? Top part is just, hey, here's the surface level pain. The next part is, okay, let's talk about those business reasons around that. And then the bottom part is, how does it actually impact you? And what happens, how, how, how does it impact you? And are you ready to make that, that choice to purchase or not purchase? And the other thing that I'd like to bring up on this slide is the difference between, now, before I give you the answer, maybe I'll have you guess at the answer. There's this idea of a pain gap. And the, where do you think that pain gap, what do you think it measures? What's the gap between? I'll give you a hint. A large pain gap easier to close the sale. A narrow or small pain gap, harder to close the sale. So you think the pain gap, what's, what's the, what's it measuring between what and what? I know it's a hard question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway, cause what the heck, it's five after four on a, on a Tuesday. What do we think? Sam, we need like Jeopardy music while people are typing. I have great vocals if you want me to sing it myself. No, that's all right. Thanks for the oh. offer. You're, oh, you're, I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> don't, say, don't ever say it didn't offer. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right. If we don't have any takers on what that pain gap is. Yeah, you might have uh, gave them a riddle on this one, Matt. I haven't seen anything in the chat just yet. That's all right. So it measures the difference between where someone is today and where they want to be. Wait, if I may say in Gregor's defense, right now, before you even mention that, he put between the present and the future. Basically, yes. So where are they today? And where do they want to be? Because if, that, if, the, if the gap is huge, way easier to close the sale. But if the gap is narrow, if they only have to do like, it, it's only a little bit of pain. Well, if I'm only in a little bit of pain, I might not do anything about it. So here's an example. Um, my my back isn't the best in the world, right? So I, I got a little bit of a sore lower back, but it's not enough to go to the, to the doctor about. On the other hand, I did something to my elbow last week and I hurt like a son of a gun. It was a big pain there. So where I was, was holy cow, this hurts. And where do I wanna be? I wanna be pain free. There was a big gap there. It drove me to the doctor to get a cortisone shot. So are you running that type of litmus test with your prospects? Where are they today? Where do they want to be? And can we take where they are from that surface level pain, work them through the reasons or the problems for the, for the surface level pain and get down to that personal impact? Now I want you to take a second, and this is for your own edification. You don't have to share this. This is for you to write next to you on your, on your scratch pad what are your top three surface level pains that people come to you with that your product or service solves so if i were to go to carl and say carl i need your product because fill in the blank christy i need your product or service because fill in the blank what are those what are the two or three top reasons why people tell you they need your stuff I got an answer from Christy right here, Matt. 
Uh, I believe this applies to the question. I think she's responding to your question that you just asked. Uh, do planks keep your core strong? Incredibly, <laughs> incredibly important thing you can do for your health and strength. Very true. So she's talking about my back problem. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for thanks for for looking out for me, Chrissy. I appreciate it. <laughs> and she wrote, "LOL." She's, she's listening. <laughs> So yeah, this next piece is for you. And the important part about understanding the surface level pains is because if you get these right, if you really understand your business and you understand why people come to you, those surface level pains become the basis for your 30 second commercial. Um, Carl mentioned it's hard to maintain compliance. Perfect. That's a great surface level pain. So if I were Carl and I was given my 30 second commercial, I would throw some emotional word in there. I think back to the 30 second commercial that I gave at the beginning of this session, throw an emotional word in there and a surface level pain. We know people buy emotionally and we know the problem, one of the three main problems that they have. So if I were Carl, I made sounds say something like, you know, people that I, I work with and the problems that I solve, the the folks that I work with are usually scared or nervous that they're not um doing what they need to do to to meet the industry standards i don't know if i said that right carl but you get the idea so these surface level pains hooked up with a an emotional word will become our 30 second commercial so let's talk a little bit in more depth about what how to get someone from the surface level pain down to that personal impact so if you haven't been subject to this before, this is the this is the Sandler submarine. I'm sorry, this is the Sandler pain funnel. Ooh, ooh, wake up, Matt. Yeah, four four ten on uh, on Tuesday. So this pain funnel is a guide to help you work through those surface level pains, through the business level pains, and down to the personal impact. Now, are you? Should you? Can you? use this um, slide word for word, you can. I don't necessarily recommend it. This slide is really a guideline for you to help understand if someone is qualified in terms of having a pain that you can address. Right, so again, we, I'm gonna go back to last week. You don't wanna mix up interest and qualification. And this pain funnel will help us quantify the level of pain someone has so we can decide if they're a qualified prospect or not. If we can't get down into personal impact, it's going to be harder to close the sale. If I ask Gregor or Carl or whoever's on the phone, you know, did you really get pain out of that? account that you were trying to close. They're like, yeah, well, they really needed a new XYZ thing in Majabi. Well, that's a surface level pain. That's not, that's not the real impact. Now, here's the problem that your prospects have is they don't, they don't understand that they just have a surface level pain. It's our job. I'll, I'll even go as far as to say it's our responsibility as salespeople to help them realize what the impact is on them for not making the purchase. I'll say that again, it's our responsibility. I won't say it word for word because I can't remember two seconds ago, but it's our responsibility to make sure that the prospect understands the personal impact that's associated with the pain that they brought us. So think about even the questions that I asked Gregor, when he was talking about how he purchased his, his couch. I don't know whether it was a couch or not, but you, you get the idea, you know what I'm talking about. So tell me a little bit more about the problem that you had, Gregor. And he told me. Now, did I go to, can you be more specific or give me an example? No, because it didn't make sense. Remember, this is a guideline. But if you're selling and it makes sense, so someone says to you, um, Carl, uh, you know, I'm they, they come to you and say, I want to, uh, I need your stuff because I need to be in compliance. 
Carl might say, well, tell me a little bit more about that. Nice open-ended question, right? To get the prospect talking more. And then the prospect will, will give him some examples. Carl might say then, hey, can you help me out? Can you be a little bit more specific or give me an example of what's happening so I get a better feel for it? Now, why do we want to ask that question? It's kind of like when you ask for a referral. When you ask for a referral, if you say, hey, do you know anybody? Well, hell yeah, I know about 7 million people, right? But if you can say, hey, do you know anybody who owns a business that is in the capital district that is struggling because of what's in COVID? Now, yeah, that's a little bit more specific. I can wrap my head around that. That's what we want our prospect to do. We want them to be able to wrap their head around their own problem. So we're going to ask them to be a little bit more specific. It's, it's if it works, I mean, if it's applicable, make sure you ask the question. Next question is how long has it been a problem? Now, why do we ask this? That's an easy one, right? I'm going to ask it how long it's been a problem because if it's only been a problem for a day, it may not be a big deal. On the other hand, if it's been a problem for three years and they haven't addressed it yet, it may also not be a big deal. So I'm going to ask, how long has it been a problem? I'm, folks, in sales, we are commissioned, and this is a great rule, by the way, our commission is directly related to the amount of information that we gather, not what we dispense. So asking these questions is gold for us if we're commissioned on the information that we gather. So how long has it been a problem? Gregor tell me, tells me, you know, it was about a year and a half. He tried, and I asked him, you know, did you try other things? Did you try throwing pillows on the couch, moving your TV? So what have you tried to do about it? Yep. And did it work? Well, clearly it didn't work because he's back talking to me. Because so I, I didn't ask that question. Again, the next one is, so this next one, for those of you in business to business sales, this is a huge question. How much do you think it's cost you? And it's important to ask that question because that question helps us understand the financial impact on them. So when we do talk about budget, Astra, talk about it next week. When we do talk about budget, now we have some impact to fall back on, right? So if they're not doing something, so let's just take an example. Uh, go to I don't know, somebody's world and, you know, say that, say they're not compliant in Carl's world or yeah, say they're not compliant in Carl's world. And Carl says, well, you know, what happens if, if you get caught? Well, that's an X amount of dollar fine. How many trucks do you have? Well, times this many. Wow. So it sounds like it could be a, I don't know, $30,000 problem. Is that right? Well, yeah. Now that you put it like that, well, is that a lot to you or is that not a lot to you? $30,000 is a lot to us as a business. So that's the other thing. And we'll talk about budget next week. So I'll stop there. Um, it's important for you to get this cost out monetarily, if at all possible. And the last questions, how do you feel about that? Now, that's a gutsy question, right? You better have done a really good job at building rapport with someone to be able to ask that question. And you certainly can't put that question at the top of the funnel because you haven't earned the right to ask it yet. It's at the bottom for a reason. And then the last question is, have you given up trying to deal with the problem? The other thing that I like to do at the bottom is you can, you can actually do this a different way. You can add one, add a little something at the bottom that says, uh, you know, so, let me ask you, uh, Sam, on a scale from one to 10, where one is, we're gonna be talking about this again in a year. Look at Sam, also, he's got his back straight now, he's listening. But one is we're gonna be talking again in a year, um, and 10 is your hair's on fire and you have to take care of this tomorrow. How important is this to you? Wow, that's another gutsy question, right? But if you've earned the right to ask these things along the way, they're not hard and you'll be surprised and, and I'm sure I've, I've got some very seasoned salespeople on this call right now. Um, someone write in the chat if they've ever gotten 
to, to the point where they've worked with a prospect and the prospect got so emotional, whether it was anger, whether it was crying. I've seen people cry on sales calls. It's not, I'm not proud of it, but it helps them. It, it's almost cathartic for them. So has anybody gotten someone to the point where they've gotten that, where their prospect has gotten that emotionally involved in the process? If not, that's okay. So this pain funnel, if you look at the first three or four questions, actually the first two questions, I'm sorry. The first two questions are your surface level pains. You work through your middle, uh, one, two, three, four, five questions. Those are your business level pains. And then the last two questions are your personal impact. So if we want to make sure that we're qualifying a prospect, let's bring it all the way back to last week, we put our process in place, that we're not going to present early like those traditional salespeople do. We're only gonna present to people who are qualified to hear it. Do we have a good pain step? And here's another thing about the pain step that I would like to leave you with before I go to the next slide. The pain, when you're working with a client and you have decided that you're gonna have that first sit down meeting with them, I'm hoping that you've identified at least two or three surface level pains to be able to have that conversation. And if you've identified two or three surface level pains, you need to bring the, prospect down the pain funnel on each one individually. It's not a pain blender. It's a pain funnel. So each pain that they have, you're going to bring them down this, this cycle and get them emotional on each of the individual pains that you're talking about. And it's super important that you do that because I mean, if you think about your sales call, Anybody who's had a, that's been in sales a long time, even if you haven't been in sales a long time, if say your, your sales call is, uh, say you have a, a one call close, and I know most people probably don't have that. 80% of the time in your sales call, you should be talking about pain. 80%. Because that's the thing that's going to drive them to purchase is pain. All right, so how are we doing on time? We got about five minutes ish. All right, next slide. Here's uh, the next group of 7,000 of uh, Sandler rules. So, based on what's up, here's what I'd like you to do read through the rules. Which one resonates with you? Someone like to share of why that specific rule resonates with you and I didn't even put the two in from that we did earlier anybody want to step in there come on we're almost done don't lose steam on me now gregor says number four all right so which one's number four one two three four the problem the prospect brings you is never the real problem Ding, 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 winner, winner, chicken dinner. 100%. And uh, if you have a second Gregor in that box, tell us why that's an important rule for you. And while Gregor is typing that, I'd like to hear from other folks as well. Uh, Janine says, this isn't about the customer. Uh, Carl says, no pain, no sale. Charles says, no pain, no sale. No need to waste time on prospects who don't need what you're offering. That's exactly right. It's a rule that would have saved me a lot of time over the years from Charles. Yeah. And and I tell you, Charles, if it makes you feel any better, I wasn't introduced to the Sandler methodology until I was in my probably uh, early 40s. And the first 20 years of selling sucked. It was freaking hard. <laughs> so I get it, man. 
Um, Gregor said he learned it through every client he's ever sold to. Yes. So remember, Gregor has said the problem the prospect brings you is never the real problem. And then Scott mentioned we started our law, our we started our law firm technology consulting to reduce or eliminate that technology and the lack of time pain that attorneys have. Okay. So be careful, Scott. That sounds like a feature benefit sell to me. Don't say your features and benefits. Figure out what the problem is. Have them talk about it and figure out for themselves that they need your product. Um, so that's uh, that's good. Let me go on to the next couple slides and we'll wrap it up here. So in terms of where we are in the process, this is the beautiful, lovely Sandler submarine. And these two parts of the submarine here, those are your relationship phases. We didn't cover those, by the way. These middle three things here are your qualification phases. That's what we're spending time on this week and next week. And then these two pieces here, those are your closing phases. So this is where we're spending the time. So if you look where you are in our selling methodology here, we're, we've built a good relationship, excuse me, and we continue to build that relationship. We take control of our sales calls and our sales process by setting appropriate expectations with our upfront contract. Today, we've learned how to uncover pain, how to get from surface level pain, work through the business issues, and get down into that personal impact. Next week, we'll talk about budget and decision. Now, before I leave this slide, it takes a high degree of guts to get to that personal impact piece. Lots of folks that I coach wimp out at that point. They get through the business level pains and they're like, eh, that's close enough. I don't really have to ask them how it impacts them personally. Well, if you don't get the personal impact, I'm going to tell you that you're probably jeopardizing your ability to close that deal. So, Go the extra mile. Um, and then, whoops, guess I gotta get rid of the annotations, huh? So at the end of this step, we wanna make sure that we review all the pains. Remember, we're gonna have at least two or three, preferably four or five. We're gonna make sure that we've done pain by numbers and uncovered the cost for not fixing it we're going to figure out and summarize the consequences and we're going to check in with them and make sure that we've covered everything so when i finish a pain step with a client it's like okay sam um these are the things that we've heard this is the impact that i've heard this is the financial impact that i heard this is the personal impact to you that i've heard what am i missing what didn't we cover? And this is your opportunity as a salesperson. If you know that there's something that they should be having in their head that they don't, this is your opportunity to bring it up. And you don't do it in a feature benefit way. So when you're summarizing, it might sound something like, hey, Sam, you know, usually um, when I'm working with a company like yours, this other thing typically bugs them. And I didn't hear you talk about that. Is that something that we should have a conversation about? And they may say yes. And if they do, then you, you got another pain point. The more pain points you get, the easier it is to close the deal, right? And all this time that you're doing this, although this isn't a, a relationship phase step, you're building trust and rapport the whole time because I can tell you, unfortunately, with a high degree of, of uh, conviction that your competition is not getting this deep in the conversations with with your clients. This is the stuff that sets you apart. And that's it, folks.
We are at the half hour. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time. Again, if any of you would like to uh, connect, get free content, get a newsletter, um, just wave and say hello, have a 10 minute quick Zoom introductory call, happy to do any of those with you. So thank you. Sam, I'll let you close this up. Hey, thank you, Matt. Thanks for doing this. Um, another great session, very interactive. Um, part two, keep in mind, guys, part three will be happening November 24th. In the email that will be sent to you around 4.45 today for our feedback um, survey is the link to part three of our next session, our final session. So we do appreciate all you guys um, attending this, you know, providing support, and hopefully you guys found some value for the conversation today. Um, thanks again, Matt. We appreciate your support. Thank you to the Good audience stuff. for joining us. And follow Ignite You on social media for future events, webinars, accelerated programs. And don't forget to follow Sandler Training Albany on social media as well and connect with Matt on LinkedIn. So thank you, everyone. You guys have a good night. Stay thanks, healthy. everybody. Enjoy your night. And you guys have a good rest of your night. Thank you, guys.